Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, and you, my friend, are listening to Light Talk. Well, good morning. This is Stan in Gainesville, Florida, and today we are discussing smoke alarms, wacky voltage, and being a more complete designer, all on Light Talk. And this is David coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Lumen Brothers! Well, welcome everyone to episode 160, the end of another pretty uh, boring week at home. (laughs) (laughs) I I, I had Sputnik come to visit. That's right. Uh, Stan has Sputnik flying over his dining room now. I do. You know, it would really be cool if that was a mobile. You know, somebody said, does it come with sound? And I said, yeah, it will be the whirling sound of winches flying it up and down like they have at the Met. You know, those are fantastic, right? You know, we're all about the same age. Do you guys remember in like 1957 when Sputnik was launched? I was like two years old at the time. But I do remember this propaganda film or animation they would show on television of like this animation of the Sputnik. And there was like this little beep, beep, beep. And it's our world will soon be coming to an end. Beep, beep. The Russians have launched Sputnik. Beep. They are watching us. It really scared the hell out of me. But I was a little child, and I remember that. To this day, I have these nightmares. Listen, but, I don't think anyone knows what the hell we're talking about. Uh, Stan bought a uh, chandelier that actually looks, sort of looks like Sputnik. I think it's much a more 60s sort of homage. It is called the Sputnik chandelier. Oh, if you, if you oh there yeah. you go. Very interesting. Anyway, let's get off this and go right into the show. Steve has our first listener question. Sure, it's Rhonda up in Chicago, and she writes, Is it okay to disable the smoke alarm in the room where we do our shows? The fog machine sometimes sets off the alarm. Right. uh, uh, uh. (laughs) It depends. (laughs) It's an interesting kind of question. She doesn't say theater. She says the room where we do our shows. Yeah. yeah. So this could be a club. Um, I don't know. It could be a garage. It could be a theater. It could be a church. Uh, So I don't quite know where you are. But I, I always think disabling a smoke alarm is, uh, you know, a risky idea. But certainly theaters do it um, all the time. Uh, what it means is you're going to have to pay a fire marshal to be on site for your performance. And you're also going to have to make sure you're not violating any, uh, any city ordinances by doing that. So you have to approach it with safety first. It's not just going somewhere and flipping a breaker or putting a piece of duct tape over it. Uh, You do mention smoke. Uh, You know, if you're using a hazer, a hazer is a lot less likely to set off a smoke detector than a fogger is. And it all comes down to the size of the uh, haze or smoke particles. Uh, A a fogger uh, is going to have a particle that's larger. It's going to be more in kin to what a... uh, a a fire smoke is. So that sometimes gets you in trouble. Um, You know, it's been my experience that a water-based hazer um, is less likely to set the smoke alarm off than an oil-based hazer. If you're using dry ice, dry ice is a whole lot less likely to set off um, your smoke alarm than something floating in the air is. But at the end of the day, Uh, You have to be safe. You have to think about your audience. You have to think about your performances. Anything can happen, and that's why those smoke detectors are there. Well, we have a a situation at the university here where it's pretty strict. Um, Our production manager uh, has a form that we fill out. We have to be pretty extensive about what we're using. And we do have these smoke uh, detectors that use a laser so they they shine across a a volume of space they hit a reflector and they bounce back and that's what triggers them so when we use any kind of atmosphere um, we have to call our you know whoever they are the guys who run the HVAC and they shut it off from a centralized location we have to give them the dates and so they so they know and the fire department would know if you know, that that's what we're using atmospherics during, during their production. And it's, a bit, it's quite a bit of a process. We have to do it in advance uh, because the odds are particularly sensitive because we have a, like Steve says, it depends upon the, you know, what you're using. It also depends upon the type of detectors. We have a very tall space 
that has evacuation fans, uh, smoke evacuation fans, which suck the air out. Because we have a large volume of oxygen, fire feeds on that. So the detectors we have are really, you know, they will be triggered. And there are lots of them all over the building. So they can put, the, they've already done experiments. We know which ones in the building have to be turned off. And that might be something that, Rhonda, you might look into. You know, with the ones that are in proximity uh, might be more important to be worried about than the ones that are not and deal, deal with the appropriate people um, who handle that. And for us, we have a huge penalty. If the fire trucks are called because an alarm goes off and we can't stop them before they get to campus, we have to pay. Like there's a, there's a financial cost to false alarms where we live. Yeah, I don't think it's ever a good idea to disconnect smoke alarms. I, uh, I know that we do it all the time. <laughs> and yes, uh, like Steve says, we have to hire fire people to come, you know, firemen and women, which is not a bad thing because these people look pretty damn good. <laughs> so it's nice to have them backstage. You know, it's funny because in Italy, they have the entire fire brigade there, whether the smoke alarms are off or not. It's just part of their safety rules. And so you'll have like 15 to 20 uh, fire. And there it's mostly men. I don't think I've ever seen a firewoman in uh, in Italy. Have you ever seen that movie Backdraft? Yes, Backdraft. Yeah, but that was a famous yeah. film. Uh, wasn't that a Quinn Martin production? Uh, no, I don't think so. It was more recent than Quinn Martin. That's back to like, you know, Michael Douglas and the streets of San Francisco. But but Backtrack had, a, you know, was was sort of a cult fire movie because the fire personnel were all, let's say, very well cast. Beautiful, beautiful people. And they still are. I mean, you know, thank God That's for right. uh, fire and, and police departments. I'll be, these are great people because these are first responders. So, Truly so heroes. true heroes, especially what's happening right now. But, you know, both my, I don't know if you guys knew this, but both my parents were police officers and they were, you did they were uncommonly yeah. good looking people too. So <laughs> <laughs> what, happened to, what happened to you, I David? I didn't become a police officer <laughs> because I did not pass the physical requirements, let's just say. <laughs> but yeah, getting back to this, we all love haze in our shows. And usually whether or not you can have haze is not only a safety issue, but it's, well, it's always a safety issue, but it's not necessarily fire, but it also has a lot to do with the lungs. And I know in some shows that I do, especially shows at high altitude, for instance, at Central City, the singers union will not allow it. AGMA is the singers union, whereas AGMA will allow to have haze, probably in Dallas, obviously in Las Vegas. <laughs> but it's also interesting that in Chicago, there's an AGMA rule that they allow haze at the Lyric, but they wouldn't allow Hayes at the Harris Theater. And the funny thing, at the Harris, that is a newer theater <laughs> with better ventilation. So I don't know. Sometimes you wonder why, what, where these rules come from and, and if they make sense at all. But yeah, I would never, ever disconnect a smoke or fire detector without getting permission from the proper authorities. Doug in Boston writes... David, you recently said that your designs are 80% the same from production to production. What is the 80%? I know you like box booms, but what are your essentials? Well, okay, I may have been exaggerating. As Stan and Steve know, <laughs> I have a tendency to do this. <laughs> I wouldn't say they're 80% the same, and I don't know what point I was trying to make, but probably because uh, there are essential angles that I personally do love to have in my designs. But the bottom line is that you choose the, the angles you use depending upon what the approach and style of the show is going to be and, of course, what the set design is going to be. Because you could say, you know, I want high side light, but if you have a full ceiling and you can't get high side light in there, well, it ain't going to happen, right? So you have to understand that I was talking about what angles that I really like. And I must say that in a lot of my designs... I do have these angles. Back when I was using mostly conventionals, I would hang like three or four pipe ends from the edge of every pipe per color. I would have high side light on each side, usually in two colors. I would have high boom lights, uh, you know, lights that are toward the, the top of the booms that would sweep across the stage, usually in two colors. I would have head highs, usually in two colors, and I would have shin kickers. I would have diagonal backlights. I mean, I, mean, I would have all these angles. That's my favorite. You know, and, and, you know, I'd have diagonal front lights, too. I mean, they, it's sort of like if you have an open stage, if you're lighting dance, 
then it's sort of all those positions I absolutely adore. Two of my favorite positions, obviously, are the pit booms that I would have, uh, pit shin lights, which I love as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not for every show, but, you know, for a a lot. I always have them there just in case because directors that I work with usually love that angle for certain moments. So they're there. And I do that. I mean, I will place a light there and we may never use it. Who cares? It's there. It's a lot easier to have it there when you're hanging the show than it is to add it later. So all these are very important angles for me. And now that I'm using mostly moving lights, I replace those three lights I had at the end of the pipe as as pipe ends with one moving light. Usually I would have six lights because three would be one color, three would be the other. Still only one moving light because you can change colors in the moving light. So color changing has added a lot of flexibility and a lot less weight to our pipes. What do you guys think? Kind of agree with most of what you said, but I think think if I had a, if you held the guns in my head and say, pick a favorite angle, it'd have to be diagonal backlight or diagonal front light, but it would, you know, box boom side and upstage left, upstage right, shooting downstage. I love that on the angle. Steve? Chocolate. Give me some <laughs> damn chocolate. The, <laughs> the hell know, the angle. Give me the chocolate. The, uh, <laughs> he likes ice cream that's light. Absolutely, that is absolutely right. The, uh, <laughs> you know, I've never thought about it very much, but I do think you're on the mark when you say um, uh, you take those basic ideas from dance and incorporate that into uh, your show. It's interesting because people have a tendency to think very um, uh, small. Uh, They think, I'm doing theater, therefore I'm doing these positions. I'm doing dance, therefore these positions. I'm doing rock and roll, here come the park hands. (laughs) It's interesting that more people don't incorporate uh, elements. It's just light. It's just light. Rather than saying, oh, I'm doing opera, therefore I must have 500 lights. I'm doing a black box production, therefore I must have 14 lights. It's it's about selecting uh, angle and sculpting. And for me, um, I guess the thing that is kind of um, current in my shows um, is things that are not balanced. I'm not terribly interested in my old age of uh, symmetry anymore. So I'm going more toward asymmetrical shows. I'm interested right now in shows that are very raw and very kind of ugly, ugly topics, uh, topics that make you leave the theater maybe uh, a little uncomfortable. So I'm I'm just, I'm in a different world than I was 30 years ago. So for me, angle of attack is everything. But if you can do a good dance plot, you can do good angle of attack. Yeah, you have the flexibility. You know, the thing that really... I think has held me back is the lack of a Roscoe mix book. If I had a mix book, then I'm telling you there are all kinds of things that I could do. I could take that mix book to a new level. I could rent you one. Oh, <laughs> screw you, Stan. Rent this one. You know, I just want to say something about what Steve said, like about ugly, ugly or angle of attack and, and just things that are, are raw. You know, I, I'm kind of like, too, I'm sort of get. show me something I haven't seen before. You, do, use the same lights that we all have or angles that we all have in ways that I've not, I'm, I'm looking for things that I've never done before or haven't seen before. The only thing we didn't mention actually were like footlights. We didn't talk about footlights. I mean, do you guys yeah. use footlights a lot? Sure. Yeah. Love them. Yeah. It depends. It depends. It's interesting you talk about the pit rail. Uh, when the wind spear opened, they put a pit rail pit in rails. there, and that, yeah. that was life-changing. Yep. For listeners who don't know, that's a position, a pipe that runs along the downstage edge of the pit so that you can actually... In the, in the pit. In, yeah. Yeah, it's inside the pit. <laughs> See yeah. if you can get that past the musicians. But a lot of musicians don't even go near it. The pits are deep enough that you know the lights mm-hmm. are much higher. And that gives you a wonderful, wonderful position without having an actual light sitting at the edge of the stage, which can right. be unsightly. Uh, yeah. But it's used all the time, too. They used uh, birdies for that. And also now these new LED fixtures, these small well, those LED little, fixtures. Cute little GLP movers that Steve loves. Or, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of different great uh, lights you can use nowadays. But pit positions, pit rails are great. And also, there's always this position that is really needed in the theater. Many theaters have it because they're they're smart, but a lot of theaters don't. And that's called a pit boom. 
it's like between the plaster line and the first box boom, the nearest box boom, you kind of need another boom there. And it's mm-hmm. usually going to be where the downstage edge of the orchestra pit is, maybe a foot upstage of that. And that will give you this amazing, great torm-like position, torm angle that will blend in with your first torm. And by the way, the first torm is a vertical pipe just upstage of the plaster line. So it's like a a vertical boom. That's That's an absolutely essential position, especially if you're doing any type of box set uh, to get it in. And don't let any any set designer design a box set where the walls go all the way down to the plaster line. (laughs) We had to add those in our theater. We added those. We call them pro booms, proscenium booms, right behind them. Booms, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Yeah, right I wanted to mention, I did think as you were talking, David, I thought of another thing that I like, if I can get it, not necessarily your position for a theatrical fixture always, but any kind of light that's integrated into the scenery, I love, and um, when you can get it. And um, now, of course, with LEDs, and we don't have so much heat to worry about, we can get lights embedded in scenery in ways that we couldn't before. And I think that that's something really adds a glow and a, and a sort of you know, sort of a finesse to, to scenery sometimes, whether it's whether it's an elegant thing or whether it's a more raw and, you know, sculpted thing, but just there's something, there's something great about that. Well, Scott in Washington, D.C. asks, uh, my museum is installing a ton of new Bluetooth-based wireless control lighting. Oy vey. It's very technologically complex. Uh, I'm a designer. Do I need to understand the technology if my primary job is design? I'm finding I have some resistance to learning the technology. Wow. Yeah. I have I have a uh, been doing a dance lately with Bluetooth technology myself, and it's been extraordinarily frustrating because it doesn't always stay connected, and I find it tough. But I guess um, I guess this is a question of degrees. It's sort of like, you know, how well do I need to know the software that I use to do my job? Do I have to understand the code underneath it? Probably not. Um, but at the same time, I probably need to know it well enough to make it do what I want it to do. So I think the resistance might be something I, I wouldn't, you know, when I heard this question, I thought about somebody, I don't know who it was in one of our interviews or somewhere I read it, maybe it might've been Ken Billington who said, you know, the design, when moving lights came into the theater, the designers who embraced it still have careers and the designers who said, no, I'm never going there. They don't have careers anymore. So I think as things develop, you sort of have to stay, as Steve has said many times, you have to stay current. But I don't, But in terms of depth, I think that's a judgment call. How deep do you need to understand the technology? Enough so that you can do your work as a designer. But if you can't achieve your design goals, then you don't know enough about the technology to use it. Because lighting is technologically based. So that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking you got to push over that resistance, drill down enough so that you can make use of it and smile while you're doing it. Yeah, a little bit of knowledge is dangerous, though. I'll tell you that from my point of view, (laughs) because I was never really interested in the technology. I I just wanted the tool. It was sort of like when synthesizers came out and I was playing mostly acoustic instruments and I loved the sound of the synthesizer. I loved the power of it. You're talking about the DX7 now, right, from Yamaha? No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the Moog synthesizer. Oh, the Moog. Yeah, the DX7 was a later uh, variation. But it was a totally different sound. And, you know, when Wendy Carlos came out first and did Switched on Bach, it changed my world. It just blew me away. Then Emerson, Lake, and Palmer came around and Keith Emerson was using the Moog and it, it just completely completely changed music. A lot of people were really into that technology. And, you know, looking back, it's really kind of simple. It's basically voltage controlled oscillators and filters and some step sequencers, things like that. But at the time it was overwhelming. So I really wasn't that curious to be quite honest with you with that type of technology. I just wanted to play with it. So I bought one and I played with it. And it's sort of the same with me with, with lights now. Now I do, yeah, I'm a little more curious now about how lights work because, it really is my profession. Uh, and back then, I was like 15, 16 years old. I just wanted to hear the damn stuff. I think it's important that you do know the technology, but understand that there are also people around you on your team that know it a lot better than you do. So you never want to be um, combative when it comes to an issue where you think you know more than your master electrician. So it's best to keep your mouth shut sometimes and let the experts handle the technology. Good advice. <laughs> Obviously, Steve has experienced this. Yeah, I'm curious what Steve has to say. I, have, I know that Scott is doing something uh, 
unusual if you can imagine a building with 10,000 bluetooth controlled lamps yeah that's a that's a so he's he's stepping into something that i don't think has been done before so in some ways if i was going to be responsible for that i'd want to have a fairly good understanding of it but maybe not an engineer's level of understanding um because i've got i'm the guy that people are going to go to when it doesn't turn on but that but but then you also need but like you say, David, you need that team to back you up as well. How about the millions of people that visit that museum on a weekly basis, all with Bluetooth devices in their pocket? Well, that's right. That, that's exactly part of, the, you know, who knows? Bluetooth, you know, I, I've had my, a big battle with it lately. And it, was, it wasn't a result of the hardware. It was a result of the software team that was working with these meters that I was using from Ocean Optics, a top, a top level company. That team was incompetent, and they're fired. And now there's a new team, and they redid the software, and it connects like a charm. So there's a lot of variables in this in this question about when you, particularly when you get into wireless controlled lighting, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's like any other field. I, I don't have to be an expert to understand the job of a rigger. I don't have to be an expert to understand what the monitor person is doing backstage. I think. Um, I look at new technology, and I look at how I can use it, and then I look for people who can help me implement my design. So I'm, I'm not too worried about the, uh, uh, the deep, dark secrets of the Grand MA <laughs> if I have a, a programmer who's, who does have a passion for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, you know, I'm, I'm not too worried. I, I agree with Scott. Uh, you know, I don't want to go too far into the technology. Uh, as a designer, what happens, I think, is if you go f too far, um, you lose track of the art that you're doing, and it becomes uh, a journey into cleverness rather than artistic statement. I, I hire people who are much more clever than me to make sure my ideas are going to carry through. Hope that helps you, Scott. And um, you are listening to Light Talk with the Lumen Brothers, and Light Talk is sponsored today by... Coming to a theater near you. A worldwide viral pandemic has shut down the globe. Billions of people are trapped inside their homes. You can't help but wonder if that In-N-Out burger is safe to eat. And then, just when you least expected it, the president has been stricken down with this horrible virus. But just when you thought that there was no hope, a new discovery is made of a secret weapon that will kill the virus. Light! And not just any light, but ultraviolet light. The only problem is that this light must be delivered from inside the human body. How can this be done? From the creator of those great 1970s adventure films, Quinn Martin takes you on an adventure that you will never forget. Take your shrinkage pills and buckle your seatbelts as you journey deep into the human body in Quinn Martin's Fantastic Lumen Voyage. Join Team Lumen as they dive deep into the bloodstream, battle rabid microbes, and face the ultimate challenge of saving humankind. Travel with Steady Stan, Bad Ombre Steve, the Illyrious David, Bumbling Brackley, and Wonder Woman Anne as they journey deep into the bowels of the president to save the world and civilization as we know it. Join the Super Lumens as they pilot their microscopic submarine with their miniaturized PRG bad boy to destroy those nasty viral cells. Will the president be saved from total insanity? Will we be able to design shows again? Will we ever have sex again? Join Team Lumen as they navigate through the president's central nervous system, clogged nasal passages, and finally, way down to parts unknown, where they leave the mothership to battle the ultimate villain with handspray bottles of Lysol. So join Team Lumen in Quinn Martin's Fantastic Lumen Voyage! Coming to a theater near you, we think. And now, back to Light Talk. Well, the sounds of those ducks in the background tells us that once again, it's time for our favorite segment, Let's, Let's talk, talk About. about. And today, Stan will introduce today's segment. Well, I just wanted to uh, uh, bring up something that our Lumen brother, Steve Woods, posted on the Facebook page about uh, ETC on headset and this series that I didn't know about and I think is relatively new. And I want to just bring up the subject, particularly for teachers, because 
for me, one of the things that I find difficult to teach is, you know, unless you take a student with you on a production and they get to see how you write cues and you're on, they're on a headset with you and hear how that goes, they really don't necessarily have a sense of what that process is like. And so I really want to tip my hat to our friend Ken Billington and to ETC for putting together this ETC on headset series where you can... And I've spent some of my at-home time listening. In some ways, you could say it's boring, but if you're really paying attention, it's pretty great. I mean, it's step-by-step Ken going from his whole cue writing process on headset with his plot, with his magic sheet, even some images. And you can see how he builds cues step by step and the relationship with the programmers and then the stage manager and then this you know and and multi and and you can feel the intensity of time crunch as the clock is ticking down as they're getting closer and closer to opening i think it was really fantastic and i i was just wanted to put that out there for educators to let your students and i've certainly sent it to my students say listen to this this is watching or listening and imagining in your mind's eye a master at work in a process that's very difficult to duplicate uh, in a classroom and, gi- and give you some real guidance about how that's done. So I just wanted to bring that up and, and open the floor for discussion on that and maybe how you guys, I mean, I know that you guys take students on your productions, they get to hear you do that, but I think this is a great resource for teachers. Well, you know, the first opportunity I got to do that was when I was a grad student at SMU <laughs> because we used to have, and I think Steve probably still does this, uh, uh, an internship program with the Dallas Opera, where right. I got to serve as a like a second assistant, which was basically the gopher, right? But I got to watch Marilyn Renegal, I got to watch John Gleason, and I got to um, uh, watch a lot of great designers, you know, in, and also at the Dallas Theater Center, we had the same sort of situation. How important it was for me to listen to how designers would talk to programmers and stage managers on the headset because they always had an extra headset for me. As a matter of fact, whenever I do a show and I bring students with me, they all get headsets and listen and be a part of it because that's how you learn how to do it. You learn theater by doing theater and you learn how to work with uh, programmers and stage managers by listening to a pro do it. There are just certain ways that you talk to people and respect them and solve problems with them that if you're not wearing a headset and you're not engaged in the show, you're just not going to experience that amazing learning opportunity. In a way, Dave, what you're saying is you and others, and like I've had that opportunity growing up in New York, it's sort of a privilege to get that opportunity. And not everybody has that privilege. Even in my program, our graduate students go to the Oslo and they get to have that opportunity with those professional designers. And when they come back to campus, we can really see the change because they've had that exposure. But all of my undergrads can't get that experience. So this series provides that that experience that you had as a young man to students all over the country. So I really want to applaud ETC and Ken. I think still, and there'll probably be, I imagine there'll be more of those coming. So it's just a great resource. And Steve has our final question of the day. William in Washington writes, am I crazy or what? The voltage in my theater seems to increase every night when we're doing shows, hmm. then returns to normal the next day. Hmm. What is going on? Hmm. Uh, no, you're not crazy, <laughs> William. Um, you know, the normal kind of world out there is the power company is, you know, trying to pump out and maintain 108 to 130 volts. You know, I was in a theater and I saw the voltage rise actually to 146 volts at night. Mm. Um, you know, what happens is, uh, is if you're, um, in a large industrial area downtown, uh, that industrial load drops as businesses shut down. So... The simplest answer is the power demand is less when, when people are asleep. Mm-hmm. Less power demand means less current demand. So less current demand causes lower transmission loss. And that means the voltage is going to go higher. There's a certain point um, that it can do damage. Also, there's a certain point, um, you know, you might notice your electric bill going up. <laughs> uh, so I think it's important if, if, you, if you're noticing this kind of wavering voltages at your theater, it's not a bad idea to call the power company up because it may not be uh, my explanation. There may be something wrong in your theater. Yep. Yep. And that's important to find out uh, straight away. Mm -hmm. Or in your community. I have that problem in my house. I have these old electromagnetic organs, the Hammond organs, 
run with these electromagnetic motors and they spin a they spin a tone wheel they have actually many tone wheels that have to spin at a very specific rate uh, for for a tone to be uh, produced mm. correctly at a certain pitch, and it's really kind of a genius invention that um, Lawrence Hammonds created back in the 30s, and he wasn't even a musician, which is really kind of crazy. He created one of the greatest musical instruments of all time, and it was truly just how do I replicate the sound of a pipe organ? But that organ needs fairly constant voltage. For it to work correctly, for it for certain uh, signals to switch uh, different uh, switches in the Leslie speed cabinets and things like that. And there was one time I had five of these organs in my house, and they all worked differently. They all had different problems. And I have a Hammond Tech. Believe it or not, there are people out there called Hammond Techs. They're used a lot in rock and roll because a lot of people are still using Hammond organs. And uh, he's one of the biggest Hammond Techs out there because he you know does all the tours that come out of LA and he comes and he's a great guy, a guy named Bill Axman, a really wonderful person. But you know, he checked everything out and he said, you know, you've got screwed up voltage in your house. Hmm. So he took measurements of all my plugs. He said, that's the problem here that you're having with all your organs because the voltage is varying by like 20% in some cases. Wow. And, and he's, I said, what can I do? He goes, you got to talk to the power company. So I called the power company and they said, oh, well, we're sorry, but that's within our limits of acceptability. Hmm. There is nothing they're going to do. So there are certain times of the day where I do not play my organs. So on this topic, I'm thinking about what Steve is saying, what you're saying, David, about these fluctuations in voltage. I remember back... When I was working in Boston, we had light boards that kept losing their shows, their memory. And we had a bunch of people look into it. And I think it was Boston Edison that ran the power. And they said, yeah, where you are on Huntington Avenue, it's an old system. And you're now this is a term I'm going to throw out there. And maybe somebody with more knowledge than me can talk about it. But you're on Delta Y systems, Delta Y transformers. And that's some kind of different type of transformer. But we ended up buying these uh, fancy voltage regulators that we put between the power source of the, the outlet in the wall and the lighting consoles. And they would either, they had capacitors that would store power. And then when the voltage got below a certain threshold, the capacitors would let go of power and maintain that voltage. And if you had a spike or it was, it, or it was increasing, the uh, resistors would, would a line of resistors that would drop down the voltage. So it maintained a voltage within a, a range that you could set on these really, you know, professional voltage regulators. And my son, who actually worked for um, Exxon Mobil once upon a time over there in, in uh, Houston, they have these massive computer systems that run the credit cards and in the basements of these buildings, which get flooded all the time and because of Houston's water table. And he would say, oh, we had these amazing voltage regulation systems to maintain those servers, to keep the voltage and then back up power as well. So there would be no loss you know, in, in this redundant system. So maybe voltage regulation devices might be something not like the Home Depot style, but the professional style might help. I know I have those, I have the basic retail kind on all my computers, but maybe that's one way to sort of address that if, it, if it's causing you trouble. Well, the difference between Delta and Y, um, Delta is a, a three-phase conductor. Right. Y has four lines. It has a fourth neutral uh, conductor. And sometimes that's uh, left floating. Speaking of consistent voltage and all that and losing shows, uh, if anyone's still out there <laughs> with a lighting console not plugged into a UPS, then you really need to have your head examined. <laughs> <laughs> for people who don't know, UPS stands for Uninterrupted Power Supply. There's been so many voltage uh, spikes and lightning strikes and everything. You really need to have a UPS hooked up to your controller so in case there is a blackout brownout or whatever you're going to have that you do not lose the data on your machine buy a good one and a good one is only going to a few hundred dollars but you know it's amazing you know even in some professional theaters that i've been in where there are no ups's on projectors and there should be a i have like like five projectors in the show and they're just plugged into a 110 and i'm saying are you crazy <laughs> no, you got to have UPSs on all this stuff because it's really, really, really important. Because if something has to come, come and reboot, 
you know, or a lamp has to cool down and then fire back up again. Uh, that's a big, big gap in your show. So electricity is our friend, as they say. <laughs> and it can also be our enemy. But if you take care of yourself and you do that extra little bit of insurance, you're going to be okay. Well, the dynamic sounds of the luminoids in the background tell us that once again, you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on Spotify, iTunes, Google, TuneIn, and just about every other podcast site out there. Check out our website on lighttalk.org for future guests, and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk fun. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, if you choose to litigate the law firm of Fleck, Flop, Flair, and Glare, and their paralegal Snoot will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Long Beach, Gainesville, and the Republic of Texas. And tune in next week when we discuss even more crazy things happening in the lighting industry. All of that and a new sponsor. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable Lumen knowledge and humor around the world. So we'll see you all next Saturday morning. Stay healthy and stay happy. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Toodles. And stay home. <laughs> stay home. Get off the beaches, you idiots. <laughs>